Hello and welcome to How to Be a Data Scientist Python 101. I'm Catherine, I'm an, an experiential learning tutor in RISE and I've helped to create this course for you alongside some really talented people including Simon Massey who is uh, the Deputy Director of the ManMet QSTEP Centre, John Goldring who is the Co-Director of the Manchester Met QSTEP Centre, um, Stephen Lynch, who is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematics and its applications, and Charlie Roadhouse, a postgraduate student in computer science. So before we begin, I just want to tell you how this course is going to work. So the course is split up into four broadcasts, each with a corresponding Jupyter notebook, um, and we'll explain what that is later. So you can access them by following the instructions that we provided for you in your workbook. These Jupyter Notebooks will take you through some of the key concepts of data analysis and you can follow along with it during the broadcasts and they also have extra detail in them if you need any further context. However, if you can't access, access them, don't worry, uh, the main points of the broadcast will also be covered in your workbooks. There's also a series of exercises for you to complete either after or before these broadcasts, however order you want to go in, so you can practice and improve your skills. So you should submit these exercises at the end of this week through the RISE website and this will evidence your participation in the course. We hope you have a great time learning more about data and Python through this course. Uh, you can, of, of course, complete this at home or wherever you can carry a device to. Um, if you have any problems or you can't figure something out, you're welcome to leave a comment on this video and we'll try and help you work through it. So you can also join us here on campus. We booked a big computer lab and the cre creators of this course are going to be there to answer any questions uh, if you need any help or maybe you you're going to find this course way too easy and maybe you just want to come along and ask about opportunities for stuff that's going to challenge you a little bit more and that's absolutely fine too. So we're going to start this broadcast with an interview with the very talented people at Hive Manchester. Uh, they're going to talk a little bit about what they do and why they think it's important for uh, people to learn digital skills and then we're going to cut right back to me and I'll give you a gentle introduction as to the basics of Python as well as some tips for debugging when you're writing your own code. Okay, so can you tell me your name and your role at Hive Manchester? Yes, uh, my name is Aaron Amatosho. I'm a director and project facilitator at Hive Manchester. Cool, and tell me about a project that you've worked on involving Python. Uh, so the most recent thing I've worked on involving Python uh, was a little project to um, reorganize and uh, redate my photos. So I had over 4,000 photos in the file and going through um, individually to put the correct dates on them would have taken way too long. So I wrote a little Python script to do it automatically for me. Wow, so you saved yourself how many hours of I work? I saved myself several hours of work. Amazing. Uh, why would you encourage other people to learn Python? Um, so the biggest reason I'll encourage other people to learn Python is for creative agency. So um, we all know that tech can solve lots of problems in the world um, and we all have lots of ideas of how to solve those problems. I think the biggest barrier for people is often when it comes to kind of um, showcasing that idea or showing that that idea can work um, and without the skills of programming or how Python for example works many ideas just kind of die at that phase. Um, so if more people learn to code, more people can show their ideas and maybe we'll have lots of different ideas in the world. Uh, and tell me about your first experience learning Python. Oh, <laughs> my first experience learning Python was actually at, um, at, an, at a Hive event uh, several years ago. Um, I was learning to make a, a little robot buggy move from one side of the room to, to another um, and I was programming in Python. Um, so I'd never done Python before this point um, and I did find it quite difficult um, at first. But um, I did have these little checkpoints. So for example, after, after several hours of work, uh, I was able to get the buggy to move forward slightly. And that made me so happy and so excited and motivated to keep learning. And so that kind of spiraled out into a point where I'm using Python almost every day of my work. And why do you think people find it difficult and a bit daunting to learn Python? And what advice would you give them to help? Um, 
So just like main, learning many other new things, uh, I think people often find uh, learning Python uh, very difficult because they think there's so much to learn and they don't know where to start. And I can see why that, that can be very, very um, de demotivating, um, which is why my advice to people is always, rather than thinking of learning Python, think of a project or an idea or something small. It doesn't have to be anything grand. For me, it was the little robot buggy, but for you, it can be something else. Think of a small game or a small app or something that you would like to make and just focus on learning enough to make that um, and I think in the process of doing that you'll find that you actually learn so much more than you originally anticipated and I think it's one way to get your foot in the door and it's easier to learn much more once you've done that. Hello and welcome to the first broadcast of our How to Be a Data Scientist Python 101 course. Um, Python is a computer programming language often used for things like building websites and automating tasks but it's also great for data analysis uh, and it's tailor-made for carrying out repetitive tasks and data manipulation. So Jupyter Notebooks are also designed to support interactive problem solving and they are a great place to start learning about Python and how to use code and analyze data. Um, both of these programs can be run in Google Collab, which saves you from having to download any software onto your computer. So before you start um, following along the workbook with us, uh, make sure that you have a Google account so you can access these resources. So to access the material, you need to click the link on your workbook, which will take you to the repository that has all the resources there. Then you can copy the URL for this, then go to Google Collab, select GitHub from the top bar, copy the URL into the box, and the notebook you need will appear. So for now, we're going to click day one, and let's get started. So. The first thing you need to know about Jupyter Notebooks is that they're comprised of cells which are bits of text and code that have been separated into blocks. When you are working through these notebooks, you'll need to run these cells to produce the result. To do this, you click this button here. If you like, you can pause this broadcast now and familiarize yourself with the notebooks. Now, the first thing we want to do is take you through some of the most basic concepts of Python. The first of these is something called a variable. A variable is a container that stores your data for further use. You declare a variable by picking a name for it, in this case we have x, and you can use letters, numbers and underscores to name a variable, as long as it doesn't start with a number. You then assign a data to a variable by using the equals symbol. You can see in this case that the variable is a number. In Python, we call this an integer, but a variable can store lots of other data types as well. If that number had a decimal point, we would call it a float, which is a number with a fractional component. And variables can also be strings, which are bits of text enclosed within quotation marks. They can also be Boolean values, which are data types with two possible values, which is either true or false. If you ever need to check the data type of a variable, you can use the type function, which will tell you. And you can have a look on this here. Now that you know the types of data that you may work with, there are a few ways that this data can be structured to make it useful for data analysis. The first structure is a seemingly self-explanatory list, um, which allows users to access and store sequences of items. Notice here how each data structure has to adhere to certain conventions though. So, a list structure is defined by the use of square brackets. 
and commas to separate individual objects within it. Say you have a list of objects, but only need to access one of them. You can access it by giving the position of the object within the list, and this is referred to as the index. When you're doing this, you just have to keep in mind that Python starts at zero. It doesn't start at one, and this is called zero-based indexing. The second type of data structure that you need to know about is something called dictionaries. Sometimes we want to be able to find data without having to remember the number of which it is on the list or the index for it. This is where a dictionary comes in handy as they have different ways of accessing the data. They match a key to a value and the whole thing is encompassed within curly brackets. The keys will most often be strings, which is why you can see on this notebook they're all enclosed within quotation marks. So, there are a few other things that you need to know about in Python. One of these things is something called methods. You won't be expected to write any of these, but it's useful to know the, them as you go forward because one of the most useful things in Python is able to write lines of code that you can reuse. To do this, we use methods to wrap useful code into a reusable bundle, and we can call that up later. For example, the type function that we used earlier to identify different data sets was actually a method that was written and added to the Python language for us to use. The last thing that you really need to know is how to import data, as being able to do this is one of the key things that makes Python so versatile and able to do so many different things. For example, for data manipulation and analysis, two important libraries we use are called Pandas and NumPy. For more information on these libraries, you can click the link on the notebook for this broadcast. As you can see here, we have imported Pandas and pulled through a CSV with some data in it. Once you've done this, it's a good idea familiar to familiarize yourself with what's in there. Uh, some useful methods for doing this are listed within the notebook. So, this method displays a small amount of data and is usually used to check that the data has been imported correctly and is not being corrupted or anything. This one lets you put your data into columns. This one lets you get an overview of what's in the data set. This one gives you quantitative data, such as the mean, count, etc. This one tells you the types of data that are in the data set. And this one outlines the rows and columns of the database. Okay, so well done for sticking with us through the first broadcast of How to Be a Data Scientist, Python 101. If you haven't already done so, now that we've finished showing you the basics, you're ready to take on the additional exercises that you can access through your workbook. And now when you try and run pieces of code, there is a chance that it may not work the first time, and that's okay. Um, it's often said that programmers spend only 5% of their time writing code and 95% of their time debugging and trying to find out what in the world went wrong. So we wanted to make just a little segment just to give you a couple of tips of things you can do if your code is triggering an error and you're not sure why. So the first thing you can do if you're stuck, which may seem obvious, is to read the error message. 
So it'll tell you the type of problem, which you can always Google if you don't understand. And it'll also literally point you to the specific line of code that's causing the issue. Uh, the second thing to remember is that the cells in Jupyter Notebooks are sequential. So if you're trying to run some a cell that's analyzing code or analyzing data, it's not going to work unless you ran the cell before it that imports the data. So it's always go worth going back and running all the previous cells if you're not sure what's wrong. And the final thing to check is if you're using the right conventions. So all the things we're asking you to do are right there in your workbook. So you can always check if you need a reminder of how to do certain things. If you're trying to create a dictionary, for example, you can go over it. Are you using the right kind of brackets? Are the keys and values separated by a colon? If you're trying to pass text as a string, are you using quotation marks? A good tip for checking this is to read the code backwards because Python is structured a lot like English, so which can make it easier to learn, but it also makes it easier to miss errors because our brains gloss over the typos. And so reading it backwards is a good way of shaking your brain out of this habit. So we hope you enjoy playing around with the tasks we have set for you. And remember, you can take them at your own pace and review the resources that we have set out for you. Writing code is all about embracing failure and learning from your mistakes. So keep trying and good luck.